You know, I think whenever we're praying with the gospel, it's really important to remember that the gospel by its very nature is amazing. The gospel by its very nature, by virtue of the fact that it is in fact the word of God living and active, is amazing and incredible. And the moment we forget that, that's when the gospel seems to convey simply empty platitudes, as opposed to something which is not just relevant, but really speaks to the deep recesses of the human condition. And one particular story which really helps to convey this particular point, the amazing quality of the gospel, is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, the story of Zacchaeus, this really short tax collector. So in terms of the basic narrative, the story is relatively simple, right? So Zacchaeus is this tax collector, right? So he's seen as being a traitor to his own people, having been selected by the Roman Empire to extract exorbitant taxes from the people of God. And on top of that, he's the chief tax collector. So in a certain sense, he's the worst of the bunch. And on top of that, he is short, a fact which is painfully emphasized by the fact that he has to climb this sycamore tree just to get a glimpse of Jesus of Nazareth, who happens to be passing through the city of Jericho. Now, obviously, in a certain sense, the key part of the story is when Jesus basically invites himself over to this guy's place for dinner, right? So specifically, what he says to him is, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your home today as a result of which the people around them start to grumble. But Jesus, of course, is undeterred in terms of inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' place for a meal. Now, at this point, based on a somewhat superficial reading of the text, one might be inclined to think that the whole point of the story is to simply be inclusive, to include within the confines of the Christian community not just good people, not just holy people, not just virtuous people, but also people who are imperfect, people who are in the process of becoming the persons that God is calling them to be. But in response to that, perhaps I might return you again to our original point. Again, this notion that the gospel by its very nature is amazing and incredible. And so therefore, we're called to read the story a little bit deeper and to realize that the Lord's invitation extended to Zacchaeus is both literal in the sense that it really did happen, but it's also symbolic in terms of speaking to a deeper issue with regards to the human condition. And to properly frame this point I'm going to make, I want to share with you this contemporary example from the life of this really famous actor named Shia LaBeouf. So as a matter of background, Shia LaBeouf was one of these really famous up-and-coming actors in the mid-2000s who eventually fell on hard times. And during this, this really kind of tumultuous period in his life, he dated this other actor named Mia Goth. And he basically accused her of being unfaithful in their relationship, which wasn't true. And so basically he cheated on her and things got really ugly and, and they ended up not seeing each other for a period of two years before he entered into this rehab program, which lasted for a period of 90 days. So as Shia tells a story in the context of this rehab program, they had this recurring thing called family day, right? So um, basically there were all these attendees in the program, not just alcoholics, but people who were, you know, arsonists and, and child molesters and whatnot. And they would invite people like family and friends to attend this weekly thing, again, called family day. And it wasn't like a private thing. So it wasn't like just like the one person plus their own kind of immediate family and friends. It was like everyone. So all the attendees of the program and whoever accepted the invitation to show up on, on the Skype call, they would all appear at once in, in little boxes during this, this common call, common to all the attendees again of the program. But as the situation kind of pertains to Shia, basically what happened was that during the first week, even though invitations were sent out, no one came. Like not his mother, not his father, not his manager, none of his friends, like nobody came. Second week came and went, second week of family day, and again, no one came. Third week, like he didn't want to go, like understandably speaking, he didn't want to be reminded that no one loved him. But then his therapist said, like, I think he might want to go, right? And so Shia went very reluctantly, expecting that perhaps his mother would show up on the call. And as it turns out, it wasn't his mother, but in fact, it was Mia Goth, his old flame, his old ex-girlfriend, this person he had treated so badly, this person who, in his own words, had to pay a price to be with him back when they were dating. This is the person who came, and it's not like she had time. She was working on a movie at the time, but she kind of made time out of love for him, right? And so just picture the situation. Here's a Skype call, all different family and friends, including Mia Goth. And everyone knew that up to this point, no one had shown up for, for a child before, so they let him go first. And the way Shia tells the story, Mia just said, hi, Shia, with this really sweet, angelic voice. So no long conversation, no promises made, but just ministry of presence, as he puts it. And the way he puts it, like that particular moment changed his life forever and helped him to understand what true love was really all about. 
Because up to that point, in his own words, he had always tried to rationalize love in the sense of saying, well, look, this person loves me or wants to be with me because of what I can do or what I can have. And because he's a poet, he, he kind of put it in a really neat sort of way. So he said, you know, back in the day, I would look at people and say, well, look, they, they, they love me or they want to be with me because I'm sensei, right? But, you know, what happens when the dojo burns down? What happens when the dojo burns down and they realize that I can't camp, I can't fish, I can't even make a fire? Who will love me then? But then because of this whole episode with me and God, he came to realize that love by its very nature is kind of irrational. It has nothing to do with deserve, right? So the idea is that love is freely given, freely received. And so obviously that whole encounter with his old ex-girlfriend, it completely changed his life. You see, hold that thought now and go back to the gospel. And hopefully this gives you some sense as to what Jesus' invitation extends as the chaos is really all about. So yeah, in a literal sense, he is inviting himself over for dinner, right? But in a symbolic sense, there's something else going on here, right? So take it all together, right? So he's the tax collector, he's the chief tax collector, and he's short, right? So basically, you know, everyone hates him. Everyone puts him in this box of, of ridicule and shame. And here comes Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, right? And he comes to him and says, look, I want to be with you in that place. I want to be with you in that place of shame and, and ridicule and self-hatred. I want to love you there. And that's what completely changes Zacchaeus' life. And that's why he says those things that you find in the gospel, right? So, you know, I, I will give to the poor half my possessions. And on top of that, if I have defrauded anyone, I will pay them back four times as much. So he really enters into the space of loving others as Christ has loved him. So he, he does these things. It's important to see this. He does these things not to earn Christ's love, but rather as a response to God loving him first in his unconditional, gratuitous sort of way. But that gives rise to the final detail of the story, which for my money is the best part of the story, right? And so as to be expected, after Jesus extends this invitation to Zacchaeus to have dinner in his place, and Zacchaeus responds in the way that he does, everyone else is, is really upset, right? So they start to grumble basically because, you know, why would he, why would Jesus go to this guy's place as opposed to going to more respectable homes? But then Jesus, and you gotta love this, right? He comes to Zacchaeus' defense. So he says, look, salvation has come to this house for Zacchaeus too as a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost and basically if you read between the lines here what the Lord is essentially saying to these people these people who are grumbling at what they've just seen is like look you know you see Zacchaeus and you just see a bundle of sins you just see his faults you see his failings alone but I see a child of God a child of Abraham, right? And I see not just who he is, but who he could be. And I am determined to do everything I can to help him, to help people like him become the persons that God is calling them to be. And that, my friends, is the gospel. And the gospel is amazing. And may God bless you all.